Murphy. I'm Lissy Medvedow. I'm executive director of the Rappaport Center for Law and Public Policy. Cindy Wynn is our amazing administrative assistant, and she is also a student at BC. She's getting her master's in philosophy. And of course, I have coordinated all of this with the wonderful Michelle Grossfield, who is also here and who will chime in, as will Cindy, whenever. So I want to start by saying you should all apply for the Rappaport Fellowship. So that's my first sentence. But before I do that, I want to share with you for just a couple of minutes my own journey as a lawyer because I always worry that law students feel as if their own pathways need to be very linear or very set in advance. And I want to share with you that that isn't necessarily true. So I've been a lawyer for remarkably 35 years. I went to Northeastern Law School and graduated in 85. And I had become a lawyer by default. I had moved to Boston from college to be a high school English teacher. And I have a master's in education and that was my passion and I couldn't find a job, literally. So I worked for a couple of years and then realized the only thing I really wanted to be in life if I weren't a teacher was a lawyer. So I went to Northeastern Law School and my first job at a law school was being a teacher at Suffolk University Law School. And I taught for three years in their research and writing program, which I loved. It was a great way to meld my law and education background. And I really loved it. And then I decided kind of in an alternative route, I wanted to be a law clerk. So even though I'd already been out of law school for three years, I applied for two clerkships and I, took, um, I went to the Massachusetts Appeals Court for a year, but one week after I accepted that clerkship, I was offered a clerkship at the United States District Court for the District of Massachusetts. And I really, really, really wanted that clerkship more than I wanted the Mass Appeals Court clerkship. But my colleagues in the law, my law school classmates, and some professors, and kind of my world out there told me it would be a terrible idea to ever welch on an acceptance to a clerkship. So I decided I needed to heed that advice, and I called the federal district court judge to decline reluctantly. And in a moment's inspiration, I said to him, but what about next year? Would you take me as a clerk next year? And he said, sure. And I literally was like, really? You don't take me next year as in I could be done for next year? And he said, yes, you're done. Call me in a few months. And I thought, oh my goodness, if I hadn't asked, I wouldn't have gotten it. It was just this idea on the spot. So that's my first piece of advice. Go for it. If you don't ask, you don't get. So I spent the following year and a half clerking for the federal judge. He was retiring. I stayed a little longer for him. And then I went to the AG's office here in Massachusetts, and I spent a decade as an appellate prosecutor. If you ever have a chance to work at the Attorney General's office in any state, it is a remarkable experience. There are passionate people, really smart people. You're given a lot of responsibility. It's a great place to learn. And then after I left the AG's office, I spent, as I said, 10 years, eight under Scott Hirschberger, two under Tom Riley. I actually decided I didn't want to practice law. And I wanted to go into the nonprofit sector from the public sector. And I left and became the executive director of the Women's Bar Foundation and, and the Women's Bar Association here in the state. And I did that for many years, really loved it. It's a great job to head up the Women's Bar if you're a woman lawyer who doesn't want to practice law. And then got a phone call out of the blue from an old friend from the AG's office who said, my mom's on the board of this 
wonderful nonprofit that teaches elementary and middle school kids about law and justice and democracy and civics. And will you talk to her? They're looking for a new executive director. And at first I said no, because I had a great job that I really loved. And he said, this is my mother. So you have to go talk to my mother because she's my mother and you're my friend. And so of course I went and met his mother and I have to say, she kind of turned my head around. She told me about this very cool organization. I had never heard of it. I asked all of my law school friends if they had ever heard of it. And my husband who's a lawyer and had also gone, gone to Northeastern, but after I did, no one had heard of this organization. It's housed in the federal courthouse here in Boston. And I took a leap of faith. I mean, I did due diligence, took a leap of faith, went to the organization. It's called Discovering Justice. It's a fabulous organization. You could all volunteer. And I did that for many years. With the first year being kind of hard, it was 2008. As you might recall, we had a recession. It was very painful financially. but through hard work and amazing staff, wonderful volunteers, we survived and flourished. And then some years later, many years later, seven years later, I heard about the Rappaport Center moving from Suffolk Law School where it had been for 15 years. And it had had two executive directors, both of whom I knew well. And it was coming to Boston College Law School and my old colleague, Professor Cassidy, whom some of you maybe have, he was becoming the faculty director and he's fantastic and a wonderful, smart, enthusiastic colleague from years ago and told me that the job was going to be open and I applied and so now I've been a VC for five and a half years. And the Rappaport Center is a place that our hope is that we inculcate the law student community with the notion that you can go work in the public sector for some part of your career. I used to say for all of your career, and Jerry Rappaport, who founded the Rappaport Center, said, no, no, that's too much to ask. So for some part of your career, and we want to, introduce you to the incredible rewards of working in the public sector, working for state and local government. So Jerry and Phyllis Rappaport founded the Rappaport Center. Jerry, who is 94 years old, went to Harvard Law School 70 some odd years ago. And when he was there, he was very chagrined that no one at Harvard was going into the public sector. And he literally said someday if he made enough money, he was going to give money to help law students be able to at least explore public sector work and public service work. And sure enough, through real estate, he actually made good on his own wishes and promise. And he founded 20 years ago, the Rappaport Center and the Rappaport Institute, which is at Harvard's Kennedy School, and we're sister organizations and we work together. So during the academic year, the, let me now up, I'm going to, all right, so those of you who are on early heard me share my angst about sharing my screen. I am about to try it. Cindy's gonna save me if I blow it. So I'm now gonna try and share my screen. Okay, let's see if this works. Good job, Lucy. I think, all right, so how do I do the share slides though? Uh, oh, slideshow, here I am. So can you guys see all the side slides or can you just see the big slide? Lucy, you wanna click on play from start and then everyone will be able to see this slide. Okay. There you go. Awesome. Okay. So I did it. So here you are to inspire future public policy leaders. So during, this, during the academic school year, we run programs that we hope 
give you this exposure to the complexity of public service, public policy, and the remarkable lawyers and staff members who work in these fields. So over the years, we have done programs. Recently, last year, we kicked off our school year with race and public policy. We held a criminal justice program, which was our last program of the spring. And actually, that program, kind of funny, sort of funny, was on March 9th. And it was an amazing program with District Attorney Rachel Rollins and U.S. Senator Ed Markey and Middlesex District Attorney Marion Ryan and Middlesex Sheriff Peter Katujian and State Senator Will Brownsberger as moderator. And at the end of the program, literally, Dean Rougeau stood up and said, we invite you to a reception after which Boston College <clears throat> is closing down due to the coronavirus. So that was the last program we held in person. We've done programs on civil rights and criminal justice. We this summer began doing programs on COVID-19 and we had a public health program. We are, we just held a program on ranked choice voting a debate last week. We are doing a program on October 29th on economic justice and racial inequities, which I hope everybody will participate in. Tanisha Sullivan, who is the president of the Boston NAACP, is a panelist. Mo Cowan, who was a former US Senator and now a government, um, government vice president of government affairs at General Electric and is a member of both of the racial equity organizations that have been founded this year, will be a part of the program, and it will be moderated by our visiting professor, Richard Cordray, who was the first director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. So what does our, whoops, what does, what else do we do? We do that all year long. And in the summer, we run a fellowship program, which is, I know the reason you're here. And the fellowship program is our way of making it possible for law students to spend a summer working in a state or local government office. And when I say make it possible, it's because we know that without funding, it is often so difficult for law students to be able to take advantage of public sector work. So this internship has a $7,000 stipend to work in state or local government office. It's a 10 week work opportunity. We provide you mentors. There are two mentors. You're given a mentor from the Rappaport Center Advisory Board and you're also given a mentor who was a prior Rappaport Fellow. And then I like to say, you also get me as your chief mentor for life. And I mean it and take it seriously. We spend weekly forums with educational opportunities. They used to be field trips, really experiential. This summer, this past summer, of course, all my wonderful fellows did not have the chance to go explore the city with us, but we did have a really great speaker series that was online where we had District Attorney Rachel Rollins, we had Boston City Councilor Michelle Wu, who I'm sure you know has just announced she's running for mayor of Boston. We had Steve Kadish, who was Governor Baker's chief of staff and now runs the COVID-19 initiative. We had Steve Steve Poftek, who's the general manager of the MBTA, and our fellows had the wonderful chance to engage with Chief Justice Ralph Gantz of the Supreme Judicial Court, who very tragically died a few weeks ago. So what you get, as I said, is a $7,000 stipend. It's taxable, we tell people that now, because that has become an issue over the years. And we offer, we offer internships in really any state or local agency you would like to work in. And as you see, it 
runs the gamut of energy to transportation. We've had a fellow who worked in veterans' rights, healthcare, housing, criminal justice, civil rights, employment and labor. And here are some of the, whoops, sorry, I'm having a little technical trouble. Here are some of the placements that our fellows have worked in the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, the AG's office, Governor's Office of Legal Counsel, the Mayor's Office in a couple of different places, both Legal Counsel's Office. We've had fellows who have interned in the Office for Women's Advancement, various state senators' offices, the Mass Department of Higher Ed, Committee for Public Counsel Services in the Youth Advocacy Division. I mean, Fellows come apply to this fellowship having already secured a job or not. So some fellows apply and you've already very fortunately gotten your own job for the summer in a state or local government office. And I emphasize that because federal placements are not permitted. So the U.S. Attorney's Office is not an eligible placement for the wrap up or fellowship. And, <clears throat> oh, here are other, sorry, I'm gonna have to reorder these, these um, slides. Here are some other places that, that we used to go to when we went in person. We met with Charlie Baker, we've met with Mayor Walsh. We've walked 100 feet underground in the Big Dig Tunnel, which is officially called the Haymarket Bend Building. We have gone to a maximum security prison. We've gone to the SJC, to the appeals court, to the MBTA control room, which is the picture you see with all the screens. And we've gone to Fenway Park. And I'll pause there because people always say, why Fenway Park? And the reason is that the Red Sox work with the city of Boston on many issues. Concession stands is a big issue. Traffic is a big issue, parking is a big issue, and unbeknownst to probably all of us, airspace is a heavily and highly negotiated issue. So when the Green Monster was built at Fenway Park, the seats were all owned by the Red Sox, but the air you breathe above those seats is actually owned by the city of Boston. Go figure. So. Whoops. When you are applying and you, you are secured this internship, there are really four mandatory events and I am coming to the actual application process. We have an orientation meeting in April and for the last several years, we've been really privileged to have the general counsel of the Mass Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, Rhoda Schneider, come and share with us her 10 tips for a successful internship. She, interestingly, is the longest general counsel in the history of the Commonwealth. She has been general counsel under five governors and six commissioners of education. This year, that was virtual. We have a welcome reception in May where Jerry and Phyllis Rappaport attend. We do that with our friends and colleagues at the Rappaport Institute. It's generally a cocktail reception where the fellows get to meet each other and get to hear from Jerry and Phyllis. We have our Thursday afternoon learning opportunities and then at the end of July or first week of August, we have what we're now calling our celebration of fellows. It used to be a very big closing dinner. Every fellow has an opportunity to speak. It's more than an opportunity. Every fellow has a mandatory requirement to speak for the whopping amount of 75 seconds. Is that what we gave you guys? Or 90, maybe 90, 90 seconds to share really what you did in the summer, what your project was, and what the fellowship offered you. So as a fellow, you have a writing requirement of doing one blog post per fellow. 
you have to complete a final evaluation form. We used to withhold $1,000 of the stipend to ensure that everybody fulfilled the obligation of your writing requirement, but now we're nicer and we don't do that anymore. And for the first time this summer, we offered our fellows this new opportunity to apply to write a paper, 20 to 25 page paper, on some interesting issue that he shared they chanced upon during the fellowship summer, and then work with Professor Daniel Canstrom, a BC law professor who's our faculty director. And I'm excited to say that three of the fellows this summer were awarded this grant, which if completed satisfactorily, comes with an additional $2,000. So Chris, I'm hoping that when you talk at the end, you'll mention this, what you're working on. So selection process, what everybody really wants to know. You at BC can be a first or second year law student. We want you to be passionate about community somehow show us that you care about the world outside of yourself and you show that by writing a two-page personal essay we require transcripts so we are also looking for a strong academic record we're looking for potential for leadership and we ask for references so you have to submit a resume two pages max a personal statement, two pages max, double space, two academic or professional references, and your transcripts. We no longer require official transcripts. Again, we're trying to be way nicer than we used to be. And we always joke that woe be a law student who ever gives us a false transcript. I assume that will never happen in my lifetime. And if you have come to law school with a graduate degree, you need to provide or can provide your graduate transcript and you don't need to provide your undergrad transcript. If you came without a graduate degree, then you need to provide your undergrad transcript as well, of course, as your law school transcript. And the deadline this year is Friday, January 22nd after the Martin Luther King holiday, 5 p.m. And you have to apply online this year. We have a new software system that we have implemented this past summer. So all applications have to be submitted through this online application process. And let me return to the personal statement. That really matters. And for your entire application, Michelle Grossfield also really matters. You should make sure you talk to her and work with her and confer with her at every step of the way. You are so lucky to have an amazing professional who's fantastic at her job and cares about students and knows about and cares about the Rappaport Fellowship. The fellowship it really gives you a leg up in the legal community. People all over Boston, not so much outside of Massachusetts, but absolutely within the Commonwealth, really, really know about the Rappaport Center. And when you have Rappaport Fellow on your resume, it gives you a leg up. You have been vetted already through a fairly rigorous process, and people know that you are a really exceptional law student. So work with Michelle and work with her on your personal statement. That is your chance to shine. It is your chance to distinguish yourself from your colleagues. It is your chance to, as I phrase it, jump off the page. Show us who you are. You know, we're looking for all kinds of human beings. We like extroverts and introverts. We want diversity of every kind. We want diversity not only of race and gender and sexual orientation and ethnicity. We want diversity of interest. We want diversity of personalities. We want a really cool, eclectic group 
to become the cohort of 12. That's how many Rappaport Fellows are awarded a summer. And we consider one of the most important parts of the fellowship the opportunity to build relationships and friendships among the fellow fellows. So among our cohort, it's your chance to kind of get out of your silo of Boston College Law School because there are eight eligible law schools in Massachusetts and our goal is always to get at least one person from every school. We don't always achieve that this past summer. We did not have a student from Western New England, but we had this year many students from Boston College Law School, little more than we usually do. And we choose students who really, um, who exude something special. That's what we want. We want everyone to show a little something special. And I think, oh no, let me tell you one more thing before we say thank you. Um, but I will stop sharing my screen now. The way the system, the process works is you will apply by January 22nd. The only two people who read all of the applications are Cindy and myself. We get somewhere between 75 and 100 applications. We call those down to a more manageable 24-ish. That's our goal, sometimes a few more. And then all of those 24 students are interviewed by four people. Cindy, myself, a member of the Rappaport Center Advisory Board, and a prior fellow who has not gone to BC Law, um, unless it's someone from years ago who doesn't know you, because we are very much trying to make sure everyone is impartial and not biased. So we interview shortly, I mean, as quickly as we can, and then our offers are extended in mid-February. I have tried for the past three years to let people know on Valentine's Day, it's my personal Valentine's Day gift to fellows. I can't always guarantee that, but that's the hope again. This year, we'll be doing our interviews online, which we've never done, so it'll be a whole new process. But then again, I'd say our world is all new, and so we're all learning how to accommodate it. And it's a really, really, really wonderful opportunity for students to get to explore the public sector, to have an opportunity with some funding that obviously helps you, but more than funding, with a whole network of people, an entire community becomes part of your world and you become part of our Rappaport Center family. So I'm gonna stop talking now and I'm gonna turn it over. I'm gonna start with Vanessa and then I'm going to go to Julia and then to Chris. So if each of you would say whatever you wanna say, they haven't been scripted by me, just so everyone knows. Vanessa, you have to, yes, perfect, thanks. So, and then we'll open it up to questions and students can ask any of us questions. Is that fine? Okay. So I don't really know where to start, but I guess I'll say, um, my name is Vanessa Lawrence. I'm a 2L. Um, so I did the Rappaport Fellowship the summer of my 1L year, right after 1L. And I was at the Attorney General's office in the Civil Rights Division here in Mass. Um, I think one of my favorite parts of the Rappaport program were the mentorship opportunities. Um, I really enjoyed the idea of having people to connect to. Tanisha Sullivan actually is one of my mentors. Um, and I think that's really valuable and being able to kind of reach back and um, lean on the Rappaport network is really great. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that people may have. I don't know how much else you want me to say, Lissy. <laughs> I have to unmute myself. That's fine as long as you're willing to answer their questions. Okay, Julia. Hi everyone. 
Um, I'm Julia. I'm a 2L at Boston College right now. Um, yeah, I really, so there's three things I really wanted to speak on. And the first being the speaker. So as Lissy mentioned, each week there's a speaker. Uh, for us this year, it was over Zoom. In the past, they go into Boston or different offices. Um, I was just so incredibly moved by the different people we listened to. Some we heard from Rachel Rollins, who's the Suffolk County DA, the president of NCAP, um, Chief Justice Gantz. We had the opportunity to speak with him, which was really, you know, a very, it was just a wonderful experience. Um, and then Michelle Wu, who right now, I'm not sure if you guys are in the Boston area, you might know that she's running for mayor officially. And I mean, so they each have different stories, different backgrounds. One of the things I just was so, that just left such an impact on me that I'll remember in five years, 10 years, 20 years, is sort of how these people conducted themselves and how they were speaking to us as students. Now they're successful in their own areas, um, but just giving us real life advice on top of sort of anything that's nuanced legally or anything like that. Um, it just opened a lot of doors and I was able to meet all these people I would have never had the opportunity to meet otherwise. So that was huge for me. Um, working with the other fellows and being able to speak with the other fellows and hear about what they're all doing was really uh, just a great experience. Kids, the other students were in very different areas for me. I worked in uh, the Youth Advocacy Division of CPCS, so Juvenile Public Defense. Um, and that's the third thing I kind of wanted to touch upon. I didn't have an internship planned or I didn't have a placement when I got the fellowship. And I knew I wanted to be working with juveniles. I knew I wanted to kind of be in the youth advocacy area, but I didn't really know where or how would be the best place for me to be. And Lissy helped me land in the youth advocacy, advocacy division. And I just gained so much from the internship that I wouldn't have been been in had I not gotten the fellowship likely. And then also from the fellowship and the speaker series, the other fellows, the mentors, um, all the networking opportunities. So yeah, it was just such a wonderful experience. And uh, like Vanessa said, feel free to ask any questions. If there's ever anything you know you want to ask, you want the student perspective, feel free to email me or reach out at any time. Thank you, Julia. Okay, Chris. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Chris Phipps. I'm also a 2L. Um, this summer I was at the Massachusetts Inspector General's office. Um, and like Julia, I didn't have anything lined up beforehand. Um, and, you know, Lissy and Cindy really did a great job at finding me placement in an area that, uh, similar to Julia, I was interested in. Um, and it just was a really great experience uh, regardless of whether next summer is in person or remote, um, you know, I think Lissy and Cindy are, did a, a fantastic job that exceeded all my expectations. So, you know, no matter the format, know that you're going to have an incredible experience. Um, I think my favorite part uh, just has to be, you know, being a member of this large community. Um, Cause it's not just one summer. Once you're a Rappaport fellow, you're really part, of the organization for you know the rest of your career or life, um, and you know I'm really looking forward to being a part of that because I know there were a lot of people um, that reached out to me, including my mentors uh, and the people at my internship. They like they, you know they felt some pressure having a Rappaport fellow, so they really went above and beyond. I think that <laughs> speaks for the uh, reputation of the center. Um, and, you know, having, especially Michelle Wu, I think Michelle Wu would just, you know, having that and hope, you know, hopefully she does become mayor, I think is incredible because she's, you know, first in line to give back. Um, and I think that says a lot about this program. Um, you know, as part of the application process, I second what Lissy said. I don't think I, you know, I, <laughs> when I think about it myself, I honestly don't know if I would be here if it weren't for Michelle Grossfield and all the help that she gave me. Um, so, you know, seriously take, uh, take, uh, that advice. Um, and as, as Alyssa said, there is that research, uh, grant opportunity. Um, and it really, I highly recommend it. It's an awesome experience, whether you are, you know, whether you write on or are already part of a journal, 
um, you know, it's an alternative experience to kind of build upon uh, your fellowship and, you know, have that writing aspect to your uh, resume. And uh, my topic, uh, as I say, was the first Rappaport Fellow at the Inspector General's office. Uh, and I learned a lot about it very quickly. And it's very different on the state level and on the federal level. Uh, and, you know, the, uh, not to get political, but the federal level had some shakeups um, under this administration. So I wanted to look at that uh, and kind of analyze both and compare. And this, the grant opportunity was, you know, provided me that open door to do so. Um, so, you know, I'm excited to have that and work on that. Thanks, Chris. Michelle, do you want to say a few words? Because you are really an integral key piece of this puzzle. Sure. Yeah, no, definitely. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you all. Um, the Rappaport Fellowship is just really, truly an amazing experience. I think working in law schools for 10 years now, students gain so much from going through this summer program, whether it's your first year or your second year, and it just follows you in all sorts of really positive ways throughout your career. So I, I really just can't encourage people enough to consider this opportunity if you have an interest in, in state or local government or policy. Um, it's a fabulous experience. And I think one of the really unique special things that BC Law and the Rappaport Center offer you. So um, not only are we so lucky to have them here so that we can enjoy and take advantage of all their programming, but the Summer Fellowship is um, just you know, really wonderful. So, and I, I would encourage you to work with me. <laughs> Obviously you've heard that already, but um, it's a unique application. I think, especially for our first years out there, you, you know, you might've done a personal statement for getting into law school. This is different. Um, you do really want uh, to persuade uh, Lissy and Cindy that this is the right fit for you and have your passion for the issues come through. So that's something I really look forward to working um, on with all of you, as well as mock interviews for anyone who's lucky enough to get an interview because uh, it's also early on in your law school career to have a panel interview. So just keep that in mind. I'm here to help. Um, this is a great experience to go through. It's uh, a great program. So I, I hope you all, you know, go for it and, um, and, and take advantage of what the center has to offer outside of the fellowship as well. Thanks, Michelle. Cindy, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I thought we might just point out two things about the placement, because I think Julia and Chris mentioned a really good point about placement that we might want to talk about, like even before the deadline, if there are, um, you know, agencies or organizations that have deadline before our January 22nd that we should encourage everyone to apply for those before, even if it's before our application deadline. Um, so I, I, yeah, Lizzie, if you want to talk, okay. about it, just mm -hmm. emphasize the placement, I think. Just All right, so that's a really good point. There are many opportunities out there. The AG's office often has it extends their offers long before January. So you should be looking at all of these opportunities through career services and apply for them. We, as I said, often fellows have already secured their own summer placement or not. Either way is fine, but don't pass up an opportunity to apply for somewhere. The other point I wanna make is that every year or two, a fellow who has gotten an interview, so you know you're one of the finalists, gets a job offer or knows that you will, you are about to get an offer from either an ineligible placement, i.e. the U.S. Attorney's Office, or you think you may get an offer from a judge, which you wouldn't be able to turn down. And I have been known on rare occasions to tell people that they have gotten their fellowship before it's public or before I've let anybody else know. I swear that fellow under penalty of death so that everybody is allowed to tell one human being or, you know, but I do do that when I'm obviously, when we're positive, we're gonna offer someone, but it just 
we haven't totally finished the process. So if you find yourself, if you apply and you know, and you've had an interview and you find yourself in that position, find me, reach out to me, call me, email me, talk to Michelle. I mean, Michelle and I talk to each other all the time. So make sure you let me know so that you don't miss out on either opportunity because, you know, there are times that you know you really want the Rappaport Fellowship and there are times that you think you want to pass it up and then you can apply again. I will tell you that we, um, I had, did this presentation last week at Northeastern for Northeastern Law School and two of the fellows from this past summer let everyone know that they had both applied after their first year and had been turned out. And they applied again and they got it. So that happens also if you don't get it, because obviously there are way too many great law students to be able to give this fellowship to everyone. So you should apply again. Are there questions from students? Lissy, may I add something quickly? Oh, please, yes. Uh, so I actually had my offer at the AGO before I um, knew whether or not I was a Rappaport Fellow. Um, and Michelle can attest to the incessant emails I was sending back and forth. Um, I think it can be really nerve wracking for your first legal job. Um, going through this process of like, oh, I don't know if I can say yes. I don't know if I have the fellowship. I don't know if it counts. Um, and I think I was just really um, nervous about that process. But I will say that both Lissy, Michelle, and um, Jean Mejia, who was my contact person at the AGO, were all very, very understanding. So I let the AGO know that I was waiting to hear back from Rappaport. I let Rappaport know that I had this offer from the AGO and everyone kind of like worked together and it wasn't as big of a deal as I made it in my head. So while it can sound kind of overwhelming, uh, just know that like people, it's not a rare situation and that people are willing to work with you through it and listen to like what's going on. Um, just for anyone who's like, oh, that sounds like a lot of work and a lot of pressure. It's actually not that bad in practice. Thanks, Vanessa. And Jean Mejia at the AG's office and I have worked together for years because we always have crossover of who they want and who we will award a fellowship to. And so it's, we, we are all in communication. I want to say a word about mentors. People usually ask me, how do we choose mentors for the fellows? And it's a process that I really work pretty diligently at trying to pair people up with great mentors. I talk to the fellows about what they're interested in, their experience. Some fellows know exactly what they want to do, and they submit an application saying, I've always been interested in affordable housing. That's what I want. And then they get the fellowship, and then they want a mentor in the field of affordable housing. So I make that happen. And on occasion, more than, I mean, a regular occasion, we don't have a member of our Rappaport Center Advisory Board who's perfect, and then I'll find a practitioner in the legal community to be a mentor, and that's worked beautifully. And then other fellows apply having no idea what they want to do when they grow up. And that's okay, too. Again, you still have to show passion about community and public service, but you don't have to know exactly who you want to be. And for that student, there may be a different kind of fellow. And sometimes fellows who know what they want to do ask to be provided a mentor in an entirely different area just to get a greater breadth of exposure to lawyers in the Boston area. So, and you know, I'm, I'm pretty good at pairing people. I'm not perfect. So it's, it's an art and a science. And if I blow it, then I want the fellows to call me up and say, I hate my mentor, or my mentor has never returned my email or my call. And I need to know that because I don't invite all people to return as mentors. I have 
cut off several people, including several members of my board, who I did not think were good enough mentors up to my own standard. So I don't tell them that to their face. I just don't invite them to mentor again. And same for prior Rappaport fellows. So I do consider mentorship an obligation of the fellow. You drive it. And some relationships continue long after the Rappaport Fellowship is over. And some are amazing during the summer, but then end. And some, as I said, are not ideal. So, all right. Anything else I can share or tell you? We love applications. We love BC students. I'd say come and visit me, except that I'm working from home. Anything I can share with anyone? All right, well then I look forward to seeing applications on January 22nd. I, I know because they said it, Vanessa, Chris, Julia, and also Kristen Rosa was a fellow this past summer, but she wasn't able to be here today. I am sure that you can reach out to any of them to give you information, ask questions. They're wonderful. We, we really, we love the fellows. They're the greatest part of the Rappaport Center. So, okay, everyone, be well. Thanks for coming. Let me know if I can do anything for you, okay?